So today our um, live session is about what is the future of trend forecasting. And um, like I did last time, I'm also doing this on Instagram Live. So, um, but obviously uh, we're trying, to, we're doing our best to just um, do this uh, more through Zoom because it's kind of more participatory and you guys can um, participate. So for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, you can wave your hand if you want to, uh, to speak. Right now I have everyone on mute just because it'll be easier so that we don't have surround sound from like 100 people in the video. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to start by uh, saying also that I'm going to be uh, saving a recording of this uh, session. So if you don't feel comfortable being in the video, you can also turn off your video because some people, because they're in other parts of the world, can't attend but really want to be able to you know, to see, to see the session. So I, I will be sharing it publicly. And, um, you know, I started these live sessions last week because of the, I guess, the situation of solitary confinement that we're all in. And um, it was a way of doing like a different version of my school. Let me see what's going on with my live session. Oh, God. I have to go back live, sorry. Uh, I gotta go back live. Let me just start it all over again, sorry. Um, one second, everyone. Okay, here we are. Um, yeah, so, and um, I thought, let's just put our foot straight into it. It's been really years since, um, People, myself, peers, other experts have been talking about, you know, the unsustainability of chasing trends within the fashion industry. And it's a real like a catch-22 in a conundrum because obviously we need to continue to work and we're sort of locked into a seasonal system. But at the same time, we know that we, you know, we can't keep up with all of this. So, um, so I thought this would be a really great time to, to start chatting because obviously things are about to really change in terms of our economy, our ability to buy clothing, our work, whether we will still have a job. And it's really scary, but it's also an opportunity to kind of rethink maybe how we can work and just disc, you know, start a, a point of conversation. So, um, now also, you know, with the COVID-19 crisis, um, this is directly connected to climate change and the fact that we're um, going deep into wildlife places where diseases with wild animals are existent that we are getting ourselves exposed to because we're just, because of deforestation. And also because of the um, rise in temperature, we're in general, the condition of the climate, what we're eating, we're becoming more, um, susceptible to viruses. So, um, you know, we have to, I think, really discuss within the realm of trend forecasting, what is our responsibility, you know, within this? How can we change things as a, as a niche in the industry, which has really exploded since the 2008 financial crisis? And, um, you know, what do we do? I mean, this is going to get political today. I'm just warning you, <laughs> it might get political. So uh, basically, let's talk. And um, I have really exciting news today, which is that we have two guests that will also take the floor and speak. We have um, futurist um, Cécile Poignant, who's someone I really admire. She's a social perspectivist and a trend analyst keynote speaker, teacher, editor. She's the founder of Trend Exchange uh, and Trend Tablet. I'm sure many of you know her. And um, we also have, very excitingly, the School of Speculation, which will be also telling us a bit more about the practice of uh, speculative design. 
So um, the schedule for today, I've created sort of a four point schedule to try to structure our questions and our conversations. But first we'll start with the macro trend mindset and that'll be also a conversation with Sissy. And then we'll talk about harnessing the power of speculative design and we'll have a chance for, um, for the co-founders of, um, of Plurality University to talk. And I'm just gonna introduce themselves now. It's Pierre Shaw and Kishan, Kishan San. I, I hope I'm saying this correctly. And, um, and then, uh, what else? I'm losing my train of thought now. And then we'll talk about how future fashion collections brands should rely on forecasting, hopefully in the future. And that will lead to, you know, conversations of how we can change the way we deliver our, our services as an industry. And then I'd love to talk about this idea of reality and time and reconnecting with reality and reconnecting with um, the speed at which trains trends change and uh, are delivered within the fashion industry. So um, first of all, I guess anybody want to start with uh, some questions around the importance of researching behavioral and cultural shifts? Because um, do any of you feel like it's going to be really, really hard to um, how you know how do you incorporate that within your work as a fashion designer do any of you have questions you can raise your hand just trying to see obviously this is a work in progress format so i'm trying to see if uh anyone has raised their hand or sent a message i might unmute you all maybe that's easier uh I'm not sure how, how to do this. Oh, I'm gonna mute all. I think this. <laughs> no, I'm gonna mute everyone. I think I'm hearing like heavy music in the background. But basically, um, years ago, I started shifting to uh, macro trends because I just felt like, as a designer, it was just becoming so counterintuitive to what I had been had been taught at design school to just produce 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 churn out these seasonal collections and it's been uh, really concerning to just see how fast we are forced to deliver trends within the fashion industry and sort of the dissonance in what we talk about in terms of on the one hand, uh, telling our clients that they need to be sustainable, but on the other hand, telling them, you know, this is the next big color, this is neon, green is the next big color, iridescent finishes are the next big color, knowing that producing neon green colors, it uses very toxic dyes, for example, knowing that iridescent finishes are very toxic, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and it's been really hard sort of teasing personally myself out of that. I'm not saying it's easy. There are clients I don't work with anymore. It's, it's you know, it's, it's affected the money that I make, but it, you know, it, it was a choice. So I'd love to kind of start this by discussing with Cecile, who's here. And I think this could be like a really great point of conversation because just gonna share my screen. Um, a couple of, last year, Cecina and I did an interview. And um, let me make sure I've admitted everyone. Um, so for those of you on Instagram, unfortunately I can't share the screen uh, with you, but basically on my website under insights, there's a wonderful interview with Cecile Poignon um, called Why and How Consuming Trends Must Change. And Cecile, I just want to make sure, can you unmute, I'm going to unmute you now. Hi, Ceci. Do you want to like quickly introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, sure. Would be happy to. So happy Saturday, everyone, even if we don't know exactly what day it is now. Um, so I'm in the trend forecasting family for now more than 30 years. Um, I'm, I've been starting to do that kind of job when it was not very trendy at that time. No one really knows about trend forecasting or um, that kind of stuff. 
um, um, my major interest is in um, long-term trends, what uh, Geraldine is calling macro trends, uh, because I think the, it's a very uh, good opportunity to understand the world, to know a bit in advance the direction in which we're going to go. So the whole idea of trends is not new. Um, it has always been existing. Uh, I mean, um, hundred years ago, I mean, uh, there was no Instagram, but uh, maybe it was the Queen of England or the Queen of France that started a trend and then everyone was uh, following that trend. The trend forecasting business started uh, around, uh, I would say, um, 60 years ago. So it's a recent uh, job uh, and um, my main reason to do that is to better understand the future to um, help companies doing services or products to be more ready for the future and for many years my mind is uh, into sustainability for many reasons personal uh, philosophical choice and so uh, it's been years now that I'm uh, helping um, clients to do less but better. And uh, Geraldine is a very good friend, so I'm really happy to be there with, the, with her and with all of you. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit uh, today about, just ahead of this call, about you know the importance of just really focusing on longer term trends now because uh, and how this was like a political act you know now and you know what are what are your views on this because I think it's really hard because a lot of people obviously are making their money their bread and butter through this delivering seasonal trend direction but now that we're going to face a major you know uh, economic crisis and probably different ways of consuming and also that we can link directly the uh, incessant speed of fashion with climate change. This is all part of the same ecosystem. By pushing seasonal fashion trends, we're contributing to overconsumption. And you know, how, how do you think that we can help people try to make the shift or try to understand better how to focus more on the longer term? I think we, we just... Uh, um... It's been years now that we know that we don't have another choice, that there is no planet B. I mean, if we remember the Rana Plaza, that was seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, the fast fashion is existing for something like more than 20 years, but it was not always there. So the relation with garments was very different 30 or 40 years ago. The relation to fashion was very different. Uh, so. Um, what I mean by that is that it's not because it's there now that it's supposed to be there in maybe 10 years or 20 years from now. Uh, it's not because it's there now that uh, things are not going to change. So I think the need uh, um, of change it is there for already many years, but now we have a kind of major um, um, signal. I mean, it's not even a signal. I mean, uh, the, the, the whole world is about to be locked down. So now we know that we need to slow down, that the whole idea of uh, uh, speedness, of increase, of greed, of trying to have more, to do more, to consume more, to travel more, to go uh, further, and, and so on. This is going to a point that um, the planet on which we are living cannot bear it, that it's too much. So I think it's not only for the fashion industry, but for many industries that things has to be rewired, that we need to think things in a very different way. So I guess that many of us that are um, like me in the trend forecasting business, we have to shift. We have to uh, help uh, people and industry in another way. And if um, you are younger than me, and if you are interested in going into that business, it means that you need to go in that business with a new mind, not with the mind of 30 years ago, with full conception, beginning of fast fashion, and so on. So it's it's a completely uh, change of paradigm. You know, it's things are really broken, and we need to rebuild them again in another way. Yeah, I think um, you know it's like because within the fashion system, because now we're we're just 
um, forced to do seasonal fashion trends. Uh, but, you know, we, we have to have the honest conversation with our bosses, with our teams, and just talk about it openly because everybody knows, everybody knows this that the system is not working, that we're chasing short-term profits and need to le look mm -hmm. at the long-term. So even for those of you who are, you know, working in fashion teams and don't know how to bring this up, I would say, you know, you, you can be a leader in this or you can get the information, you can lean on other experts, you can reach out to other people and you know, figure out how to prototype a new way of looking at fashion trends because it's not like fashion trends are over they'll always be there and they have there been there for centuries uh, we always need to to present ourselves in a certain way to to love them cherish the mystique of fashion and the latest trends and the latest shapes but we just now more than ever need to really have the honest conversation because uh it's like we're looking at fashion and design like this and we need to look at it as a whole as a society and its role within society so that then we can go back and relook again at the aesthetics it's almost now we've we've been so focused and obsessed with the aesthetics and the exterior veneer of things that we we just really need to step away from that for a moment and learn more about systems thinking and macro trends and also really look at what people are doing in other industries, which is, I know a lot and of people, I, uh, Cecilia, you, you know, you, you look at, I think mm -hmm. you work with uh, airlines or transportation, you work with food, you work, but originally you were very much in fashion with, with uh, Trend Union. Yeah, but I think the problem with fashion is that, uh, and it's the problem with all the rest of the industry, is that we, we put that on a very high speed, and this high speed is not, is not anymore possible. And if we, if we go back to fashion, we, we know that we had been so much focusing on short-term trends, so much focusing on the eat bag, the, the, the eat uh, piece of clothes and so much, that we completely forget to speak about garments. I mean, we spoke about fashion, we spoke about trends, but we never spoke about garments. We never spoke about the fact that when there is a, a piece of clothes that you love, you want to keep it for years, and you don't want to throw it away after, after three months or two months. And I think what, what this um, uh, terrible virus is going to, to change very much is, is our relation with a kind of uh, compulsive uh, um, addiction to shopping globally and now we have to do shopping uh, in, inside our own flat you know you have to look what you have in your drawer you have to look what you have in your kitchen you have to try to do things with what you have so I think this is interesting because it brings me to something that I really find very interesting which is the idea of uh, frugal innovation so the idea that uh, you don't need more to make to make it better you can do better with less and this is this is what is frugal innovation about it's the concept it's coming from india it's the idea that you can do something with less you can fix something with less so i think we, we need to completely um, rewire our brain and be more focused on uh, long-term satisfaction long-term directions and maybe go back more to style go back more to garments and just forget about fashion as we know it yeah and, and you know uh maybe within that we need to then i we i don't think that with this conversation we can just you know when things go back to us going back to work in our offices which you know will happen at some stage i mean we need to have these conversations. This can't just be like one moment in time. We need to allow time the same way we schedule a meeting for merchandising the collection. We have to uh, schedule a meeting with our teams. Uh, okay, what is our goal here? What is our purpose? How are we gonna work differently? And how can we implement uh, allowing more time to, to think about the big picture before we design the collections? 
because I know that as a designer, we always only had like five days to come up with the concept of the collection or do research. And I said, it's, you know, anybody wave your hand if you're in the same, you've been in the same boat. I know you have, especially those of you who work in fast fashion, but there's no time for research. And when we come back, we have to put pressure and, and say, we want to have, you know, you know, we're not going to sell as many clothing. We, you know, we have to somehow find a way to, to rebel, I think, within the system so that we allow more time for speculating, for long-term planning, uh, and for looking at the bigger issues of society at large and how a brand, how even clothing can make people live within society differently and in a better way and more in touch with the reality that we're in. I mean, I know these are sort of abstract thinking, but basically with macro trend, we need more time to look at art, to look at technology, to look at science, to look at food, to research much more deeply. And to, I think also that will allow us to reclaim creativity in our work and think more originally because trend forecasting has become so prescriptive it's become so yet yeah, this is you know the sleeve of the moment and well i don't have time to research what it is so let me just follow what this trend forecasting service is doing and just do it just follow just follow follow and we can't continue like this everything we put out in the world we need to think about it intelligently and and um I don't know if anybody has questions, because otherwise we'll go to, to our next segment. I'd love for the School of Speculation to, to talk a little bit about what they do. But uh, with, with, um, with Zoom, you can, um, you can wave, you can type in some questions. So anybody, if you want to like ask some questions to uh, Cecile and myself, because after all, this is a Q&A session, the, this is the time. So. Um, Anybody have comments on this? I'll give you a minute. Anyone to type something in? I hope everything is working. Ah, Maya. Hi, Maya, is it okay if I turn your screen on? I'm gonna unmute you, Maya. So you Hi. wanna ask your question? I'm not sure what- Yes, I was, one, I was wondering what makes you so sure that we are not going to see a huge backlash of this time of being confined in our homes and actually see people more and having less money because they are, you know, struggling financially. And actually, getting a mask for to fly more chili again to undo everything that they had to go through in this period yeah you cut off a bit so do you mean like you think that there's a chance that when we we are we go back to normal people will be consuming uh fast fashion or cheap flights more than ever yeah. you will have less money um yeah, I think definitely there's there's a chance that will happen. But um, the thing is, I think like f in fashion and design in general really has the power to change culture. So yes, there will there's going to be the world is very polarized right now, and there are many different ways of leading your life. But as an industry and as a design industry, as a specific fashion industry, but within a global, a more global. Um, ecosystem of different design industries, we have the power to change the world as well. So uh, what do you think, Sissy? Yeah, I think um, there, there will be, uh, I think the, 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 the trends the, um, um, after when, when this terrible uh, um, um, period will be over and will be gone, the reaction of people will not be only white or only black. So I do agree with you, Maya, there will be what is happening, starting to happen now in China that they call prevent shopping. So the fact that people have been like starving to do uh, 
I mean, shopping like compulsion, you know, addictive activity. So they go back to shopping as much as they can because they have the feeling that they miss it. You know, it's like the, the fear of missing out when you don't look at your phone. So it's, it's quite logical that at the end of this confinement, there will be people that will do revenge shopping. But it's also very uh, um, possible that um, this situation is, is, is something that never had happened before. It's like a, a kind of totally new situation. And there will be also people that after staying weeks away from um, uh, e-shop, staying away from shops, staying away from buying stuff, people that there will be some people that we realize that they don't need it that much. So you will have both reactions. You will have revenge shopping and you will have a kind of uh, a capacity of a certain number of people of, of uh, uh, understanding uh, this need of shopping in a different way. So I would say that we're going to see um, about, uh, you know, both of those situations and all in the middle because it's not black and white, it's all the, the range of gray in the middle. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, someone is sending a chat here as well. Let me just check whether it's from Basquiat. Um, Yusra, um, what I noticed within my job as a product developer, is that everyone able to see the chat? Um, just um, Yusra has a question, as a product developer uh, for one of the biggest brands in the world, um, they're moving very slowly when it comes to sustainability instead of taking immediate action and you work a lot with licensees and um, um, even producing, using, this recycled garments but how do you change the mindset of a number money driven to a more responsible one i think um i don't think it happens overnight i think it's big shocks like this crisis that we're in that we're just beginning to see we're only seeing the beginning of it because even when things go back to going back to work we're going to face a huge economic downturn um, this is just the beginning. So I think it's a, a little bit like um, one, one, you know, if you look at Greta Thunberg, she has how many millions of followers now and, and how, what a global movement she started. It was just one person who was protesting in front of her local government. So yes, how do you change that? I don't know, but you start somewhere. You, you start somewhere and it, I think the consumer, there are consumers, men, a growing number of consumers that want it, but we also have a responsibility within our teams to discuss this and, and to... And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I think also the the the, uh, the power is uh, uh, finally and always in the hand of the consumer. So what we notice, uh, uh, if we go back to the example that Geraldine uh, spoke about with Greta Thunberg, the fact that, for instance, she said that uh, flying is not a very good solution. <laughs> Before the the the, uh, the virus situation, what we saw is that in Scandinavia and in some countries uh, uh, around this era, uh, the number of flights were slowly getting down. We saw that Vienna was uh, starting to be really an important hub for night train. That they were opening more lines for night trains because people were uh, willing to travel by train. So I think. Um, uh, uh, making people that are uh, gaining a lot of money and explaining them that they will gain less money, this is not easy because people are thinking that the more money you get, uh, the, the better it is. But it will be also the consumer that will help the change by choosing to uh, maybe have another kind of priority because at the moment, what is the most important for me, for you, for all of us, is to stay safe and that all the people we love stay safe. This is the most important thing. It's not about what kind of skirt or trousers we're going to have next summer. So I guess that after this very terrible uh, episode, I mean, maybe the, uh, the way we see the priority is going to be different. And maybe some of us are going to react in a way that, okay, we're going to buy less garments. And it means that this will also change the way like the big fast fashion groups um, are acting. And 
they already know that there will be a slowdown. Uh, just before the crisis, they were trying to find solution by renting, solution by second hand. They know that also the young generation is, is, is different than uh, the generation before. So, I mean, what is happening today with the virus was in a way already there as uh, very small signals, but now it's getting bigger, very amplified. So yeah. I think uh, consumers are also the game changers. Yeah, definitely. I'm just going to say that I've got a couple of questions coming in about, you know, your question on frugal innovation and uh, what you said, I mean, about frugal innovation and, um, you know, how can we slow down and be more scarce when we're, we need to have profit margins. But I would really like, because we only have like 10 minutes left, to switch to um, Plurality University, sorry, not um, plur what am I saying? Uh, specu the Speculative Design School um, to talk about more speculative design because the these are things I think that um, all of you could start looking into and implementing into how to approach future trends differently. And it's a very different way of how we work within the fashion industry is very, very different. So some of these notions might feel a bit foreign to you, but I think we're on a time where we need to unlearn some ways. And for everyone who has questions about slowing down and creating that different, um, a shift in value and a shift in value exchange, I can, all I can say is that I have an up upcoming session about this I have one on um, on March 31st called How Would You Change the Current Fashion System? But I have one that could be really uh, interesting for you uh, as well on April 7th uh, called How to Create New Value Exchange in the Style Industry Through Craft and Tech. And I also have another one, Reclaiming Creativity for Regenerative Fashion Future. This is all part of an, a conversation and an ecosystem of questions and things that we're all looking at back and forth within all of these conversations. But because I'm doing all of this for free, we only have like 45 minutes on Zoom, so we can't answer everything. But I really, really hope that you guys can join for the next ones because obviously it's an ongoing series. And I hope to keep this, uh, obviously, more of it during the crisis, but I would love to continue even afterwards, obviously. Um, so I'm just going to um, switch over to present to you um, the, um, hold on, how do I do this? Should I unmute you uh, here? Yeah, yeah. 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 If Hi. Hi, everyone. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and tell us a little bit about SOS, which stands for the School of Speculation and uh, the types of uh, future futuring and design fiction processes that you use um, that you know could be really, really interesting for us as fashion designers, et cetera, to learn about. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks very much for inviting us along today and uh, hello to everyone out there. Um, my name is Pierre and then um, my colleagues uh, named Kishan. Um, obviously our background is comes from an architectural background so I hope this uh, can help you guys at home somehow. I'm just going to share the screen um, just whilst we go through and explain a little bit more about us. Uh, hopefully you can see um, that. Um, so we, we set up really as a, a way of uh, fighting um, rising uh, fees in, in design education. Uh, we feel that... Can, can, can everyone see the shared screen? Um, I, we can't see it right now. Okay. Uh, I think it's... Right, how about okay. now? Okay, uh, great. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we want to combat um, the rising um, uh, fees in higher education. Uh, we're really keen on trying to make uh, design education accessible, but also really pushing critical design um, as a methodology. And what we mean um, by critical design is design that uh, is not affirmative, so doesn't uh, create products useful for the market. Um, we're really interested in design um, methodologies that basically ask questions um, produce more questions than answers. 
Uh, one way to do this is uh, speculative through speculative design, um, and uh, this is what we're one of the avenues we're really interested in. Um, what we do with uh, speculative design is essentially create fictional worlds, um, sometimes far away, sometimes very close, but we use these fictional worlds to say something about our contemporary uh, condition. Kish, do you want to add uh, anything more to that whilst I just... Uh, yeah, so just to like rewind a bit, SOS is, is a nomadic independent not-for-profit um, design school so we're kind of hoping to make education free and accessible again as well as uh, really uh, bring critique back into design education. So one of the tools that we take to universities um, and um, agencies is are these workshops in which uh, we'll bring along a, uh, a narrative. So this project here uh, was based in East London um, and uh, we presented a, a future scenario in which Thames Water, who's a company that own and run um, water and sewage treatment in London, um, would take over a large site of uh, natural beauty in East End of London um, to basically create a large, uh, horrible, arguably, sewage treatment works. Um, so this was presented to the group. Um, this is all sort of fiction. This is all future worlds, speculating, saying, saying kind of statements that are um, supposed to be uh, producing antagonism in the group um, and really demonstrating how this, this fictional world gets put together. So following that, uh, these groups are then split into key characters in this uh, scenario. So in this particular scenario, we had uh, Disney Parks who represented this uh, other competitor for the site. Uh, we have Thames Water, the owners. Um, we have the Extinction Rebellion as a sort of antagonistic uh, character. Uh, we have the campaign to protect rural England, who obviously on the side of the area of natural beauty, uh, and then a local cafe. And we're really interested in trying to get scale of, and representation of all the groups involved. Uh, okay. Um, and then um, the game proceeds on um, a go by go basis. Each character has um, a set of cards they can only play once um, and they use these cards to um, basically interact with one another uh, one after the other during the game. So if I can just really quickly show you what this looks like. Um, so the game is really about producing political uh, debate and conversation around a specific side topic. Uh, and the idea is to have uh, actors from like states to local actors to global corporations and really demonstrate how these actors all condense over a different site and how their agendas are being served. Um, we have one card, which is like probably the card in the game, um, the policy change card. Um, so what, with this kind of workshop, what we do is we're trying to get students to think not just about design uh, as like aesthetics or design within like a very narrow understanding uh, we're trying to like broaden it to policy change to how how cities work um, and because really try and get designers to think about uh, the, the politics of what they're doing uh, first and foremost because every design decision um, is underpinned with like embedded politics um need until you start unraveling it, interrogating it that you can really understand what you're what you're doing um and can if i may just i just want to step in like can you just tell everyone um a bit about you know your process because it's such an interesting process in terms of how you uh, interact with everyone and make it more of a workshop process because 
uh, within the um, you know fashion design uh, traditional model, obviously we always uh, just research trends. We're always looking at what everyone else is doing, and we don't utilize these kind of more workshopping techniques where we're um, putting ourselves, immersing ourselves in a fictional situation and that involves just uh, society in a bigger way and not just uh, the, the product output. So, I mean, for, for you, what, what's the, you know, what's, if, if there's anything you can share about, because this is, I think this idea is very foreign for us, but I think incredibly important because it involves just uh, immersing ourselves again in the experience of of the world and also in a much more artistic practice that involves real critical thinking which is what we're missing in the fashion industry and, and what we discussed before getting on this video call you guys were telling me about also bringing in more artistic practices into your into your techniques yeah, I mean, the, the, this, te this particular technique works especially well in the sector that we work in. So universities and schools, it, it's kind of quite a natural uh, scenario for it. But, you know, we've taken it to uh, the kind of corporate uh, commercial um, companies and, and, and that side works really well as well. And I think there's, there's merit in... Um, allowing allowing a bit of time just to get into these characters and get into the a fictional world and setting aside time you call it r d call it research call it whatever you want but just being able to learn that 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 really important skill of kind of switching perspectives or uh trying to argue something from an, uh, a, a perspective that you've not really come across before or even considered as was as valuable at all is so 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 important um and it's that i think is this the sort of real important critical uh it's what makes your thinking critical right it's, it's being able to to um produce arguments and, and relate to other arguments and other perspectives i think really interesting about this uh method well is that the the practice is participatory uh and getting to together 20, 20 participants um, each acting out one of five characters by the end of game piece of research we've developed a kind of like a network of understandings between the actors like um, that kind of like link up all of all the kind of uh, the work and thinking that we've been doing uh, around it already so like we've we've produced workshops not just on thames water also on how uber is changing our cities on how apple apple technology changing our cities um and this kind of methodology is so easily to um to different teams there's well. actually there's a number of really interesting questions and zoom has just inform me that I have extended time so we for those of you who can stay a bit longer um, you're welcome to obviously I know that um, I had scheduled this to be 45 minutes but someone uh, um, someone by the name of Didi said do you think there will ever be some sort of fabric resource rationing do you think it would help to change the mentality of consumers designers and fast fashion brands and i think something like speculative design would be a gr and these types of workshops would be a great way to scenario plan this uh, potential future where we would have to ration resources where we wouldn't be able to ship from abroad possibly when there's a, a pandemic because let's face it there's a big chance that these types of um spurts of pandemics might happen more often and this will become something that happens from time to time and so to your point dd that's why something like speculative design could or thinking could you know enable us to prepare for these plans or even prepare for say for example an industry where it's more about slow fashion and garments that we use a lot or interchange 
and prepare for those ways of, of designing that or selling that as, as teams, not just the design teams, but bringing in people from marketing, bringing in people from production, et cetera. Um, you know, these things might sound a bit utopian, but we need utopia. We need some utopian thinking right now, I think. And um, there's so, yeah, I mean, anybody have questions for Kishan and, and Pierre right now? Um, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Trying to see everyone. Um, Anybody have questions for Kishan and Pierre? Well, I'll just um, go through some of the questions then. Um, and maybe some questions will come up a bit later. But um, uh, let me just see. Um, how, so there's a question for Cecile. You talked about. Um, frugal innovation, and this is usually focused on innovation and scarcity. How do we keep this scarce, frugal mindset when our surrounding is striving and praising abundance? <laughs> because maybe the future is not that much about abundance. Maybe we have to reframe our way of thinking and be more focused on be uh, really, uh, from the beginning, uh, um, designing with um, what we call in French uh, eco-conception. So it means that to really conceive and design something with sustainability at heart. So maybe um, I think um, there was a time that we saw it was, uh, um, um, I mean, the world was full of, of, uh, of product, resources, uh, materials, but we realized that um, our planet Earth is limited. I mean that the very rare uh, uh, materials that are used in our smartphone, um, I mean, th th there is a certain number of those materials, but it's not a full abundance. And it's the same for everything. So I think we have seen uh, already that by destroying the ecosystem, um, we're going to have less resources in the future. So I think there is a politic, uh, political commitment by uh, trying to make the best of the few you have. And I think this kind of crisis and confinement like we have now, um, I don't know, but for instance, when I'm cooking now and when I'm, you know, uh, 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 cutting the vegetables, I'm very, uh, um, um, I think that a carrot is very precious, that a broccoli is very precious, so I'm trying not to waste it, you know? I'm trying to keep as much of it as I can. So I think maybe this confinement moment will help us to realize that we have already a lot of resources that we should try to recycle them, to use them as much as we can. And maybe that the whole idea of a, a hyper, uh, uh, um, uh, fastness, uh, uh, abundance, uh, um, hyper, uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, development of thing is something from the past, you know, and that we have to come back to something that is more uh, meaningful, more sustainable, more focused, with less resources. So maybe, as you said, the, this innovation, the UGAD innovation, is something that we will need to implement in everything. Um, it could be a teapot, it could be a, a, a table, it could be a garment. How can we use less material? How can we make the best of a few things? And I, I, I think, think that's, back to, can I just, oh, yeah, 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 can sorry. I just say, uh, I think that's a, it's such an interesting concept, frugal innovation, because I think SOS is kind of a frugal school. So we, we run an art and design school with, with uh, no space, no teachers, no students. Um, but we still, we still make it happen with the limited resources have by scrounging, by ducking the thing, by sharing. Um, and really, it's, it's not an unsexy term. It's, it can be applied in a pretty, like, pretty, um, a pretty beautiful way. Um, but it's just about reshaping your conception of these kind of traditional modes of 
um, operation. So, like, what really is a, how do you really form a school? What's, what's yeah, the core I mean, of it? And uh, for us, like, it's really not the four walls that you're within. Um, there's a question about, you know, what will be the future of fashion education? And then we have a question also from uh, Flavia Mandoka, Mandon, Mendonka, sorry if I'm saying people's names incorrectly, but she's talking about having trend forecasting as a political process. And, and, and I think it's all part of, as, as a fashion education, whether, and even, you know, your process through the School of Speculation is, 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 is becoming a political act and it's about, you know, taking a stance. And um, we have a responsibility, you know, right now we didn't, we knew that supply scarcity was coming. We, we didn't know exactly which form it would take, but we knew it was coming because even with Brexit, there was uh, a threat of scarcity. Um, with the current uh, epidemiologists and scientists have been warning that we were ripe for a big virus, but also look, there's huge problems with water scarcity that we're about to face. By harnessing the power of speculative design or just thinking differently about future trends, not just as a materialistic motivation, but as something that plays a role within society and fashion, you know, we could go back to work and talk to our teams and say, I want a scenario plan for a potential future where we will have limited water and how will that impact us as a brand, as a team? What's our responsibility? And or, you know, if people are consuming less, some of you have posted questions about, um, you know, how will we continue if people are buying less as an industry? Maybe do we flip the script and become more of a service, more of a support, you know, in some aspects? Um, you know, how do we share our intellectual property as brands as well, our story as brands? We, we need to, to, to get our hands dirty and, and dig our, our ourselves out of this hole. I think, you know, we've been digging ourselves into a hole as a fashion industry and as, as trend forecasters who are facing the future, whether you're in the school of speculation, whether you're in speculative design, design fiction, future trends, you should be at the forefront of this. We, you know, you, you should be leading. We, we have a role to lead, I think, and to, to be at the front of this. And uh, I don't think there's that much to lose because we've already lost so much in the space of a few weeks. I don't know. I'm pretty gung ho about this, as you guys can tell. That's why I'm like hosting these conversations. Um, but um, there's more questions. Anybody want to chime in by video? Otherwise, I'll continue um, going through questions and maybe we can wrap it up within five minutes because I we've gone a bit over time and I really, really appreciate all of you joining and we, I really, really hope that we can have more of these conversations. And I just want to point out that um, Kishana and Pierre have a school online. They're really trying to shape things up with the education system. And if you are really interested in learning more about speculative design, you can, you can go to the website. I've, I've shared the link in my um in in the chat there um but there's another question uh you know um will consumer psychology become the most important tool for foresight uh what what do some of you think i think it's already like that i mean yeah. it's uh the, the more it will be the more we will need to uh, um, go back to uh, learning and understanding what is called humanities you know i mean taking um uh, no more about psychology no more about anthropology no more about philosophy i think we really need to go back to global meanings global explanation of um what we are as human beings, what is our purpose, and how do we uh, react? I think this is going to be, of course, super important, more and more in the future, that's for sure. And I think the solutions for us as, a, as forecasters and designers who utilize trend forecasting, just to bring it back to the industry, is stepping away from our comfort zone and not 
really looking at what's in the fashion industry or consumer psychologies within the fashion industry, but like what Cecile pointed out, study anthropology, study biomimicry, um, you know, look at speculation, look at science fiction writing, just really like open up your airwaves to different ways of working because clearly the way we were currently working is working is functioning to some extent but it's a little bit like a house of cards and it has very flimsy foundations i think so uh because obviously it also depends on a whole economic and um, consuming system that is that is uh, being questioned right now um so i'm just gonna go through one more question and i think we then we can wrap it up um one question, Ella says, do you think that trends that were predicted before the coronavirus are still relevant or will trends completely change because of the impact of the coronavirus? I mean, it's true, it's, it does feel like fashion trends, everything has just been put on hold and I don't know about you guys, but for me, even when I'm getting like emails trying to sell me clothing, I'm just like, oh, stay away from me. Like I'm not in the mood to, to buy, buy stuff right now. And I, I don't know how, I think on the one hand, people will party like crazy <laughs> when we get out of our houses. But on the other hand, and possibly, you know, finally shut, but on the other hand, I think many will be very frugal by, by, by choice or by necessity, you know, by, by sort of uh, philosophical choice, but also by necessity. Um, yeah, I think if we speak about long-term trends, I mean, the long-term trends will still be relevant. I mean, one of the biggest long-term trends is about sustainability, is about slowing down. We have already uh, slow food, slow travel, uh, uh, slow everything, slow cooking. So, I mean, that whole uh, uh, path is going to grow and to get bigger and bigger. I think what we will have after those uh, uh, weeks of confinement is that we will have a lot of mental health problems. That is for sure, because people are not used to be, even if we have some kind of social life, like we have the possibility to see each other on Zoom today. But I mean, uh, I think there will be really a lot of, of, of phobia, of uh, uh, problem of mental health that we're going to have to deal with after the confinement. So I mean, the long term trends for me, they will be still relevant and even more relevant, more sharp and more bright. And about the short term trends, yeah, I'm exactly like you. Geraldine, whenever I see uh, uh, um, an advertising to sell me whatever, I'm just like, okay, I don't need that whatever, you know? So I think um, shorter trends are going to be um, maybe not so relevant, but long-term trends are still going to be very, very relevant. And um, I just want to wrap things up also, um, unless, I think, yeah, I think we're running out of time, but I think also it's about living in uh, the reality of our times because um, the, the, and when you talk about mental health, you know, even before this crisis, there were a lot of problems with mental health. And as a fashion industry, we're pushed to produce, 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 season, season after season, season after season, people get mentally exhausted. They, they're, the creativity gets just sucked out of them and they feel in a way hostage because you know we have to work, we have to pay our bills and uh, we don't know how to get ourselves out of this cycle because it's the way the whole economic system is built and how brands sell their clothing towards uh, you know, seasonal models of four collections a year and then a bunch of capsule collections. But the fact is that, um, you know, this is not realistic. And we have to create a new reality, a new, a new sense of time. Do we really need that many clo clothes all the time? Do we really, really need to fly for 10 pounds to Copenhagen? I mean, we were living for in an alternate reality. And I think it's gonna be really, um, we, when we go back, we can continue business as usual and continue promoting a seasonal model that is part of our overconsumption problem, but it will only loop us back to the same issues over and over again. And we've been turning around in circles. 
And I think at some stage, as, as people working in the business of future forecasting, we have to, we have, to have a very honest conversation um, you know, about, about changing the speed at which we push our clients to, to, cre to create product, if that makes sense. Uh, I think the future of forecasting is, it's not someone is saying, you know, Adrien Cadio, a really talented forecaster saying, what can slow forecasting mean? At one point we see that digital micro trend are not sustainable. What about the carbon footprint of trend reports? What about the carbon cultural footprint of predicting for so many different clients, the same color scenario? I think it's maybe time to rethink also the mediums of trend forecasting. Yeah, that's such a that's such a good point. That that is absolutely such a good point, Adrien. So is that you there? Hey, do you want to speak a little bit? A little bit. Okay. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, Adrien is a really interesting <laughs> forecaster. Everyone. He's done projects with a studio called Imprudence who are a future trend studio that does a lot of speculative design and he's the head of their future trends. And I think um, you guys know each other, Cecilia, as well. It's probably a lot of people who've kind of been in touch in this space, but can you tell us a little bit more about your thoughts on that? Maybe delivering uh, trend reports or forecasts in a different way and the footprint of that. Yeah, I was just like, um, before everything happened, I was uh, reading a very interesting book on the history of trend forecasting and especially color and fashion forecasting. And um, before there was like the so-called trend agencies we all know today, there was also another sort of creative, creating uh, reports, fashion journalists, and there is something like very inspirational I may maybe share with you. It's called like the Tobe Reports, which is a woman in the late uh, 20s uh, who created reports with typing right uh, type machine. Sorry. And it's like uh, the name of the book is, it's well known, but it's so cool to always read it, I think. Wow. But it's like um, very inspirational because at first uh, with di digitalization, we came at the moment where trend reports were going so fast and we do it by now websites. But at the first, it was like uh, doing just uh, color charts, uh, doing just typewriting and set in and set it uh, weekly to your clients. And you took like a very short time to create and to like give inspiration in a such format, which is like, so. It's all text and yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so a slow way of writing even the trend reports because um, I don't know how to, uh, the first, like I was reading earlier, the first typewriter was enabling us to write only in upper letters and the paper was hidden under the mechanism. So you were not able to see what you were typing. Another one inspiration is that our clavier uh, was made according to the letters we commonly use the most. So even the process and the machine we use today uh, to create vision is like so fast. Everything came so fast and we do it so fast. And we like used to give the same vision to all those different clients, even if, if we have like four themes or four visions, it's always the same and it's going to be like, uh, an impact in the culture because it's you're giving vision, so you're giving imaginaries. And I think today, even the mediums, even the um, the way you create and the way you write inspiration has to be rethink in yeah. a way. Yeah. Kind of overwhelming, but mm. maybe I think, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more because, um, you know, like even in uh, in my space, when people ask me about digital beauty, digital fashion, augmented reality, AI, and I was like, and people, everyone is like, yes, it's all about artificial intelligence now and uh, using that for fashion, but hold off a second, you know, uh, uh, powering one AI bot uses like the energy of five cars. like. 
we just in a time where you're right, we have to think about everything and all the sameness that we saw in fashion since for the past decade, there's been an increase and increase in sameness. You can link that to the explosion of the of trend forecasting as a service right after the 2008 global exactly. financial crisis, where we we became at a time of of a crisis of uncertainty, where we were handholding and reassuring people with our expertise, and then our industry exploded. And many people came on the scene and we were giving the same insights to everyone and created a type of eco chamber, which in fact has uh, made our fashion industry too homogenous. And uh, th that's one of the things that we could really help undo. I, re I truly believe that if we redefine our trend forecasting ways, our methodologies within design teams, that we will be able to free up time for original design. And we will see a rebirth of that type of creativity of truly original thinking. Because right now, what you're saying is, is that also what we're seeing now is, is very prescriptive. You know, it's very prescriptive. We're telling people to, to do exactly that and feeding yeah. into their anxiety to have it wrong. What if I have it wrong? Let me, let me look at what the forecasters are saying. Okay, they're all saying that. I'm going to do rather than having that critical thinking, but also uh, Pierre and and Kishan are saying are trying to teach people how to do within universities, within companies, and and we need to put a really critical thinking hat as as designers and as forecasters. Um, yeah, so. especially if we have to like focus on micro trends. Yeah, because I yeah. think it's a way. Yeah, more yeah. than ever. <laughs> Well, um, we couldn't answer all the questions, but thank you everyone for attending and really thank you for your time. We, we went over the time and I didn't uh, expect that, but once we were in it, it was just nice to keep chatting. So um, I think we're just going to keep talking anyways. I've, I'm trying to save all of the questions in the chat, but I do think that anyone who didn't have their question answered um, just, you know, please attend the next session if you can. And again, for those of you who join later, this is, uh, you know, this is recorded and I would really, really love to uh, share this uh, on YouTube, if that's okay with, with all of you. Um, any, any, anyone okay with it? Every, if, if you have an issue, I can see how I can block you out or I can, I probably won't be able to block you out. Actually, I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I do have a responsibility to let you know. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I hope this uh, gave you some nice things to think about, uh, not just for this weekend, but for, for the future. OK. Bye. I'm going to say bye now. But thank you. Thank you for your time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.